Welcome to our Picmonic webinar series. Picmonic is a powerful multi-sensory study tool to help you remember all the information you need to know in nursing school fast. This pre-recorded live webinar will be a three-part series on electrolytes made easy. But before we get into it, make sure you head to picmonic.com to sign up for a free account. That way you can reference the Picmonics that are talked about in the lecture and continue to use Picmonic to memorize all the topics through to the NCLEX. So without further ado, here's Kendall to teach you about electrolytes. My name is Kendall Wyatt. Um, so I am uh, started out as a paramedic, um, then I went to nursing school, and I'm actually in my third year of medical school now. So I'm broadcasting um, today from uh, Phoenix in our Picmonic sound booth. So this is where our Picmonics are actually recorded and whatnot. So if you've never used Picmonic, just a quick little intro, what are what is Picmonic? Um, so Picmonic means picture mnemonic, and what we actually do is we take text and things like um, text and things you need to memorize, and we turn them into phonetic characters that you need um, that you need to know and easy way to remember them. So like pen, penicillin, which is one we use all the time, we use the pencil villain. So you see this pencil villain. And amoxicillin, another antibiotic, we would show this armor ox. And we would, you know, show you an interactive way, like a phonetic character, we'd show you this phone, and we would show you that those are um, those fight bacteria by actually showing you a picture of them fighting this bacteria character so that you know that they're antibiotics. And we use images to help you associate all the things you need to know so you can rec recall them very fast um, when it comes to exam time. So we, have, we cover over 700 topics in nursing. And each one has um, at least 10 facts that go in with it for everything you need to know in nursing school. So you have lots of these images that you can learn and almost remember anything you need to know as far as medicine. So what are we going to go over today? Um, so we're doing electrolytes. So we're going to go over um, some imagery and things of how we're going to show you some pictures and what we're using and everything we're doing here today. We're going to go over the normal values because you've got to know the normals before you can really know the abnormals. We're going to go over trends and some abnormalities, and then we're going to do a quick review. Now, one of the things that I, I really stress all the time is that you really have to understand a general concept of everything you're doing in nursing school. So you guys... As you're out there in nursing school, whether you're, you know, first semester, second semester, second year, third year, whatever, wherever you are, or if you're planning to take the NCLEX right now or next week, is you should understand the concept of everything. Because if you don't understand this big picture concept, you're not going to be able to critically think and really get the answers correct. And that's where you really have to, um, you really have to, um, it's really where a lot of your knowledge is going to come in to help you always get the answers correct. So um, one of the things I'd just like to mention is that inside of your GoToWebinar control panel, um, aside from seeing my beautiful face, um, you will see a question box where you can go in and type questions um, and shoot anything out. So we have Steve and Matt on the background there um, helping me out today. But uh, if they can't immediately answer your question or it's something that's relevant to what I'm doing, I'll, I'll definitely address it. And I ask lots of questions as I go through. So you can just type in your answer right there and, and we'll go from there. So. Just get all that stuff out of the way in case any of you guys haven't been in. So let's go ahead and jump right in to really like just some things we're going to go over. And the first thing I really want to touch on is um, cellular exchange. And this is like physiology pain points, right? Pain. This is awful stuff that no one likes to know. But I want to just go over this general concept here. And I've just got a cardiac myocyte. And what I've done is I've, I've stripped out all of these other mechanisms, all these other channels and ion channels that are in here. And I want you to understand that. Um, so what happens with all of these is that ions go in, in and out of cells all the time. These electrolytes, they go out of a cell. Like let's say cardiac myocyte, potassium, K here, freely moves out of a cell. But as it freely moves out of a cell, then something like sodium will freely move into the cell. But at the same time, there are lots of other mechanisms. But so intracellular is inside the cell. This ICF means intracellular volume here inside the cell. And this ECF is outside the cell. So inside of the tissues itself, this is maybe inside of a cardiac tissue. And outside the cell, maybe the actual blood that's going past those tissues. And um, that's kind of the big picture of the concept of how you need, how you need to see this, like how you need to really um, understand um, what's going on. So you can see those, like it, this, this ion goes out, potassium and sodium goes in. So there's always a balance. And I'm not going to go into physiology, you know, math calculations, because there's potentials and whatnot, lots of advanced things with this. You can really go in depth. 
But the thing I really just want you to understand is that these work with gradients, and they work with um, so if, if there's if there's a lot of potassium outside the cell. So let's say I put lots of potassium on here outside the cell. Hey, potassium! Now there's a bunch outside the cell. Do you think that it's more likely or less likely that this potassium that's inside the cell is going to go out? Well, I'm going to tell you just a little secret. If there's a ton outside the cell, it's going to then the potassium isn't going to freely keep leaving the cell. It's going to, of course, back up inside the cell. So then you end up with a whole bunch of potassium and hyperkalemia. And we're going to get to this concept again. And at the very end, I'm going to tie this exactly thing back, this whole thing back together again, and show you another mechanism of how this works. Hopefully, and you just pull it all together, and you go, "Wow! Oh my God! It makes so much sense. I really understand it now, and I can memorize it all with pictures and keep it all together. And I'm going to do amazing." That's what we're going to go for today. So we're going to we're going to add on to this at the end, um, just as a quick review to pull it all together, and that's a really important point. So if you have a situation like hyperkalemia, we're going to show you how it's going to cause these um, cardiac myocytes to be crazy excited, and they're going to go nuts because they're building up all this intracellular calcium and with lots of other mechanisms. So inside of Picmonic and a lot of everything you need to know to follow along with this webinar today, the Picmonic product as well as this webinar follows the, we use the, I use the exact same images inside of our product and or similar images. And this is anything that's hypo or low, you're going to see a hippo, a hippo. So like hypocalcemia, this is a hippo head calcified cow, Hip, hypocalcemia, a hippo. So anything that's a hyper inside of our product is a hiker. So you're going to see whatever it is as a hiker. So you're going to see this hiker calcified cow for hypercalcemia. And that's how you can always see which character is which. And what we do is we associate these images that really just ties in together. So if you see a hypo, then you think a low, whatever the character is. Low calcium, hypocalcemia, low calcium, hippocal. And if you're going to see more. If you've, if you've never seen Picmonic, you really master it by the time we get to the end. And you're going to just be like, your mind's just going to be blown. should be well, hopefully. Maybe it's just my mind. I'm not sure. I forgot to mention that tons of times throughout this is I absolutely love to throw out corny jokes. Um, not just like corny as in corny bacteria, but um, really corny jokes. So I hope you enjoy those. And if not, you can just like plug your ears or something. So one of the most important things is you have to know the normal ranges of all these lab values. And I would, I've, I've hit five of them right here um, that I, I just want to touch on to really show you how you can use pictures to help you remember them. And an important thing here is that I've organized these from smallest to largest as far as the volume in the extracellular space. So if you know the normal ranges, um, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, ca chloride, calcium, chloride, sodium, then you know, you memorize the normals, then you can then memorize what's abnormal. So if you know what's normal, then you know immediately whether it's abnormal, um, or you know that it's high or low rather. Um, because it's really important as you go through. You don't want to get a question, and you don't want to not really know because you didn't have the lab value down, especially as you go to NCLEX or you're going to your exam, especially if you're going to like HESI or a final exam. Um, you really want to have these lab values down. So we have, we have 32 lab values in total in our product, but we're going to go over these just really quick to, to show you what they are. So um, first we're going to just, um, I'm just going to show you these images. So magnesium, 1.5 to 2.5. Phosphorus, potassium, calcium, chloride, sodium. I'm not going to mention all these numbers right now, but what you can see here is that I have norm ordered them from the smallest number to the largest number. And what's important to know here is if we're measuring these, if I have a 1.5 to 2.5, that means it's a really small amount, right? But that's a small amount in the serum, in, in the extracellular space, because we cannot measure intracellular lab values. I mean, we can't take a sample of the blood from the blood and measure inside the cell lab values. And we can get some indirect estimations, but there's nothing to actually do that direct. Um, that's not how we get lab values. We measure the extracellular volume because we know then that's how, it, how what those are going to affect the intracellular levels. And then we know what to expect signs and symptoms wise. So I get really excited as I go through these and you'll see me always taking a drink from my wonderful Picmonic cup which Steve so gracefully will fill up for me every now and then. But uh, as I have said before, is, you know, they give me uh, 35 cents every time I take a drink, so it's like a plug for the company. Um, that's how I get paid. But you know, I, I believe I'm, I'm going to demand a raise to 37 cents just because of inflation. 
So let's look at these lab values. So what, what we actually have a picmonic for every single one of these. So I'm going to go over each one of these in depth uh, as we go through. But when, every time you're going to see these images, and we're going to go magnesium, phosphorus, we're going to go through each one. Um, but you'll see this 1.5 to 2.5. So you see this 1.1, 1, 1, 1. 1.5 to 2.5 on this magnesium magazine. And you'll see these kind of images that we help you actually use um, pictures to help you remember the lab values. And we tie it all in for you so that you can really just pull it together. So let's just jump down, down here to chloride. So you see this chloride, um, this chlorine dispenser. And you see 95 to 105 pools. That's how you can kind of remember it because we use this pool because it's hot, right? 95 to 105. I mean, it's 113 here in Arizona right now. But if you think it's really hot, you probably want to be at the pool. And so we use these images to help you get this. And inside the Picmonic, um, today we're going to share you on a playlist that's going to go over these. And we're going to actually just touch on each one of these as we go in through just to save time. So um, we have over 32 lab values you'll need to know inside of an entire story to help you go through these. And we're going to go through it, uh, each one of these, really quick. Um, as we go through. But most important, here's what I actually want to touch on each one of these. When you think of the electrolytes and you're going through and you're learning, what you need to know is you have to think of a generalized, um, or I want you to think of a generalized theme for each one. You can't really memorize everything that goes with everything. I mean, you could, but you don't have time. And what I, most of the nursing style questions is um, they're geared towards a generalized theme. Um, or the, the signs and symptoms in, in general. So we've kind of kind of uh, put these in here for you as a generalized rule. Yes, there are, I mean, if, if you're a super nerd or um, you know that there are some extra things in here in some of these, and that's absolutely true, uh, but um, not, not to answer 99% of the questions. So magnesium, muscle relaxation, phosphorus, muscle contraction, um, and potassium, intracellular excitation. That's like, you know, the cell's getting excited from inside the cell. Calcium, we know for bones and muscle excitation. Again, chloride, cellular, cellular excitation, and sodium's extracellular excitation. So we're going to hit every uh, hit these individually and show you how you need to think about it, and then with the highs and the lows, and that's really important. So you know that if you have um, lots and lots and lots of magnesium, so if the core focus of magnesium here is muscle relaxation, and you have lots of magnesium, are you going to be really relaxed? Or are you going to be really excited, your muscles? Which one is it? Anybody know? Ah, oh, the answer is exploded, right? So if you have lots and lots and lots of magnesium, well, then you'd be very relaxed, right? And we can give magnesium as a medication. So let's actually just look, we look at these individually to show you um, how they go through. When we think of each one of these, we're going to think about the normal values. We want to know that normal value range. We're going to hit on it again. We want to make sure we know the basic function of how it works, this magnesium muscle relaxation. Um, we want to think about the body systems, how they go, and then fluid volume compartments, specifically with sodium as we go. Um, and that's how you can really just tie it in together. So here's magnesium. Magnesium itself. We just, we just talked about it, and now we're going to hit it, hit it right on ahead. Magnesium, a normal range, 1.5 to 2.5. So that means it has a relatively small extracellular volume, right? I mean, if compared to sodium, 130s, 1.5 to 2.5, very small. Oh, I think I've got the hiccups. Excuse me. So the main function we want to think about is muscle relaxation. So I want you to think about this little image here, what we draw in here. So we have this magnesium magazine, and he's just chilling, just relaxing out, relaxing out. That's what magnesium is for. And we think about the normal range as 1.5. So we got this 1 wand and this 0.5 hand to 2.5. So I always think about this 2, 2, 2, this little uh, ballerina 2, 2 here, and her 0.5 hand. So 1.5 to 2.5. Now, it's a really important point, and I hear this a lot, is, eh, my book says it's 1.7 to 2.2. Okay, listen. Every lab in America has a little bit different guidelines on what they use for a normal range. So we use um, uh, the Lewis book as far as our normal ranges, but uh, just as a reference, but that doesn't mean that in a different book it's not a little bit different or in a different lab or a different region that it's not just a smidge different on, on the, um, the, the lab values. And that's exactly how you need to think. So if you have a small ECF amount, do you think we're going to be giving large doses of magnesium or very small doses of magnesium? If we were give it as a in, a in a medication form, anybody know? Oh, you guys, that's right. 
uh, Andy right away said a small amount because if we give a very large amount, we're gonna we're gonna overload the body. We're gonna see lots and lots of problems. And we're gonna talk about that right here in just a second. So let's look at this next slide as we go through the um, highs and lows. So if you think about, we're gonna start at the top here, hypomagnesemia, so a low magnesium level. So if you think of first, I want you to think about magnesium itself. Magnesium itself is causes muscle relaxation as a general theme. Okay, makes sense. Magnesium magazine, I'm chilling out, I'm having a good time. Oh, but I'm gonna take all the way magnesium away. I'm gonna have a low magnesium level. Are you gonna be muscles are gonna be excited or are they gonna be relaxed? They're gonna be excited really excited and they're going to be like on the edge of their seat they're going to be like crazy like me and they'll be ready to go and they'll be jumping and they'll be oh my god crazy and what are we going to see well if you jump to our pigmonic we have this hippo magnesemia and he's angry i mean he's right on, he's ready to charge up and just go at it right he's excited and that's how we teach you in these pictures and the themes that we integrate all the images so what are you going to see for deep tendon reflexes if you hit somebody on the knee is that reflex going to be all relaxed out, or is it just going to be, boom, increased deep tendon reflexes? It's going to be increased. Increased deep tendon reflexes. Seizures and tachycardia. Everything is going to be up, 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 up with a low magnesium level. Because if you don't, magnesium itself works with ATP to calm, as a, it, it, it cre creates a calming. And uh, we're not going to go into the cellular level stuff, um, because the actual mechanism of action of, of magnesium itself is actually unknown, and we're going to mention that again in, in the review at the end, but um, hypomagnesemia. So you know that what level below magnesium is low? Well, it's less than 1.5. So we memorized um, our normal levels of 1.5, so less than 1.5 is low, and we're going to see increased deep tendon reflexes, possible seizures, tachycardia, and some other things. You know, you're going to see irritation, you see, you know, you see lots of things. Um, and, and those are all included, but we're just we're hitting on the general themes here to really just solidify how things are different. Because what I've learned, and as I teach, you know, tons and tons of students, if you know the general theme of how everything is different, you can probably figure out most of it. If everything's excited because there's no magnesium, then you know that we can then give magnesium to calm everything down, right? So the treatment for low magnesium would be to give magnesium. That makes pretty much sense to me. So what about hyper? Magnesemia. Now, I, this is one of my favorite pygmonic images, and I someone wrote in and they said, "Kendall, what isn't your favorite pygmonic image?" And that I have some unfavorites, and our artist team can tell you I definitely have some non-favorite um, images. But this one is one of my favorites because it portrays hyper magnesemia in the best way possible. So we got this hiker. He's got his magnesium magazine, and this guy is chillaxed. I mean, he's relaxing here, right? And his muscles are chillaxed. His hairy chest, his hairy legs, awkward. He's relaxing out there with his magnesium magazine. And that's what you really have to think about this. A high magnesium level. Magnesium's basic function is to muscle relaxation as a general theme. So what are you going to see if all the muscles are relaxed? Well, neuronal excitability is also going to be relaxed. So what do you think those deep tendon reflexes are going to be? Are they going to be up, 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 or down, down, down? That's right. The deep tendon reflexes are going to be decreased. And if we give way too much magnesium, it's going to cause respiratory arrest because what is the muscle that controls breathing? That is a muscle, right? And it's automatic. You don't have to think to breathe. Well, maybe somebody out there has to think to breathe. You have a friend that you always think you have to think to breathe, right? It's always one of my favorite jokes. I bet they have to think to breathe. But you could end up with the diaphragm being depressed as well because it's a muscle and end up with respiratory arrest. So let's think about this um, really quick as I adjust my seat so I don't fall. Um, if we have, I have to fix my posture. I got really bad posture today. So um, if we think about what situation would we give magnesium and what, what treatment scenario? Hmm. I need to give somebody magnesium to relax their muscles. I would probably give it in, ah, Benita and Tamika, both of you guys right away. I would give it in maternity with preterm labor, right? I have contractions, contractions, contractions of that uterus, right? I need to calm the uterus down, calm that muscle down, so I'm going to give magnesium. And the way I tell that I gave too much magnesium is I'm measuring deep tendon reflexes. If they disappear, I stop giving magnesium. But also, 
when we see torsades to point, as um, Benita pointed out, if you have torsades, that's VTAC, right? That's a polymorphic VTAC. So to calm that heart muscle down, we're going to give magnesium. Chill. Calm down. Slow down. We also give it in preeclampsia and some other things. But, you know, those, those are um, not as, uh, you know, th there are always more answers, of course. And a couple of you pointed those out. That's correct. So um, <clears throat> I just wanted to spend a little extra time on this just one to really go over how we're going to think about themes. So think about the themes as we go through these, and that's what I really want you to think about. So here are hypomagnesemia and hypermagnesemia pygmonic. So we've tied in all the stuff you need to know, all those nitty-gritty details in here, like hypomagnesemia and everything you need to see, everything you need to worry about, along with this hypomagnesemia pygmonic. So in anything you're learning, let's say you're out there, you're learning the concept, you, you know, you've learned... And you're good, you need to tie it all together with memorization of everything. That's where we really come in to, um, to help you keep it all together. So phosphorus, um, phosphorus is another one to remember. And I just, I just this one's actually one I'm going to skip really quick through. Um, but it's, it, it's not really as high yield. But um, you need to know the normal lab value of 2.5 to 4.5. So we've got the 2.5 to 4.5 here. Um, but um, it's for muscle contraction. So it's kind of... Um, uh, uh, what is the term? Anyway, I'll get to it. I'll think of it later. But it's a small EC amount. And it's really, you know, it's for like a muscle contraction as a general rule. And so that means, of course, that it's going to be, um, if you have a low amount, the muscles are relaxed. And a high amount, the muscles are excited. And you see like tetany. You'll see um, tetany, which is, you know, full muscle rigidity if you have hyperphosphatemia. Now, what patients are going to have hyperphosphatemia? What type of patient, if you think of a type of patient, which patient out there you are going to see a high phosphatemia in? Anybody know? Ah, that's right away. Renal patients, several of you said right away, and renal failure. Renal failure patients, you're going to see a high phosphatemia because they can't get rid of that uh, phosphate. They, they can't get rid of it, and that's a really important, really important concept to know. Um, you see that right away. So... Here's one of the highest yield ones, and I, I spent an extra couple minutes on this one, is, is potassium. So potassium, a normal lab value amounts 3.5 to 5. So I think about this 3.5, this 3 tree with this 5 hand, 3.5 to 5, and it's intracellular excitability. So as we, if you think back to that original image, so I had the, um, you know, the, the, the action potentials there, and you have intracellular excitability is potassium's job. So if you get a lot of potassium inside or backed up inside the cell, you've got a serious problem. Same if, if and we'll get to the other one, but there's you know sodium, which is outside the cell. So a small ECF amount means very small amounts make very big differences. And a very important thing you need to think about, as soon as you think of potassium is arrhythmias and heart differences, because there's some very high yield points, you need to know about high potassium and low potassium very, very high points. So let's let's actually look at them. So hypokalemia, a low potassium level. If you have a low potassium level, do you think your intracellular uh, cells are going to be excited or not excited? They're not going to be as excited, right? They're going to be de decreased excitement. And when you have decreased excitement, then you end up with numbness or paresthesias. And I always... This is one of our Paris T-shirt paresthesias. You may end up with a decreased excitement of the cardiac tissue. So if you think about this, um, and we think about uh, how it all goes together, you have potassium, and potassium helps with cardiac uh, contract contractility. So if you have a decreased potassium, then the T wave, what does a T wave represent in the EKG? The T wave... So you have the, the P wave, which is atrial contraction, the, the um, QRS, which is ventricular contraction, and then you have the QRS, which is um, ventricle um, repolarization or relaxation, right, essentially. Electrically and then physically, yes, there are differences. So um, repolarization and relaxation of that tissue. So if it's not relaxing, it's just kind of doing you know, whatever, right, it's just meh, not really doing anything then the T wave, which is what represents it, is going to be flattened. You're going to see this flattening of the T wave. And you might even see this U wave at the end. Just a little extra wave, P, Q, R, S, T, U. A little bump at the end. Um, 
and it just kind of relaxes everything. It doesn't really get that excited. But contrast that with hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia itself, high potassium level, what do you see? Well, you could see paralysis and uh, problems with, you know, neuronal excitement and whatnot, but most importantly, high yield, you're going to see these tall, peaked T waves. Very tall and peaked, and this very high yield point, and um, we had that on our question of the day, and um, there's a very important point to know is because a tall peak T wave, it causes this crazy relaxation, this crazy repolarization, and it can very commonly cause arrhythmias very commonly. It's more commonly that hyperkalemia causes arrhythmias than hypokalemia. And that's an important point um, to note because you have this very um, high potassium level. Just as an important point, though, does anybody know um, uh, digoxin? Which one of these, hypokalemia or hyperkalemia, is important with digoxin to know about? Really high yield point, uh, relatively. Just kind of one of those tidbits in the back of your mind. So hypokalemia, hypo, a low potassium level, um, inhibit, it causes digoxin toxicity. It causes it to happen a lot more often because if you don't have any potassium, this relaxation is kind of like meh, but then digoxin causes what? Crazy contraction. So it's like this extreme opposite, and then you end up with this rel really bad toxicity. That's kind of the general way to think about it. Yes, there's an ion change and you know sodium, potassium, ATP as transporters, and that's all true. Uh, but trying to memorize and wrap your head around all of those um, membrane potassium ion transporters is not as important as understanding the concept of it. Um, and that's that's really, that's how you're going to get the most answers right as well. So understand the general concept um, and you will do the best at most of your questions, especially in nursing. So um, hypokalemia, so a low potassium, well, this is our low potassium, or low potassium pycmonic and a hypokalemia less than 3.5. You see all these um, different characters which represent everything you need to know. So you see U wave, which is this arrhythmia drum with this EKG U wave right here for the hypokalemia. And then over in the hyperkalemia one, you see this tall peaked T uh, character here on the other side. That completes part one of Electrolytes Made Easy. Before we go to part two, make sure you go review the 10 pycmonics that we just learned about, which were magnesium, hypomagnesemia, hypermagnesemia, magnesium sulfate, phosphorus, potassium, hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, parts of an ECG, and digoxin toxicity. To find these 10 pycmonics in the learning system, just click on Browse on the left navigation bar and search for what you're looking for by course, body system, book, or board exam. Easy. And after you learn each one, don't forget to use the quiz feature to make sure you really have them down. There's also a playlist link in the description below. So after you've memorized those, come meet us back for part two of Electrolytes Made Easy and learn more electrolytes and imbalances like hypo and hypercalcemia. See you there.